Chaos Dwarf campaigns come in all shapes and sizes, mainly small and smaller, but across all three of the legendary lords, which one should you choose? In this continuation of my series, I'll be giving you a spoiler-free campaign overview to help you decide if it's the right campaign for you. Our first lord to discuss is Drazoeth, the exiled sorcerer prophet, leading the Legion of Asgore out of the Black Fortress in the southern portion of the Darklands. If this is your first time on my channel, the way I do these videos is by giving you a no-spoiler breakdown. I'll boot the game up on turn one of the campaign, I'll explain the mechanics of the character in question, show you their skills, quickly show off their research tree, and then give you an overall idea of what the campaign plays like. Keep in mind, this is not a guide, but a quick campaign overview to help you decide which campaign to play when the DLC goes live. Feel free to jump ahead to any part of the video that interests you the most using the chapters denoted in both the timeline and the description. Also, if you've not yet pre-ordered the Chaos Dwarf DLC, make sure you use my affiliate link in the description to take advantage of the sale. You'll get a Steam key directly from Creative Assembly and it goes a long way to support myself as well as my mini Aussie's rabid treat addiction. Lastly, be sure to check out my Twitch link in the pinned comment and description where we'll be streaming through a or playing a playthrough of a legendary campaign of the Chaos Dwarf. But let's get started here on Drazoa's campaign summary in Total War Warhammer 3. To start us off, we're going to go through the unique campaign mechanics of the Chaos Dwarfs. Now, I've already got a whole video that breaks this down in pretty big detail. So I have that linked in the upper right hand corner. In this portion, I'm just going to quickly buzz through them so that you know that they're here. Um, and it's just for continuity sake more than anything. And I'll be doing this on my Astrogoth campaign, but it's the same thing on Drazoeth and Zaton. So no matter which video you're watching, it's the same thing. I've just put it in all three videos. So taking a look at this here, we have got three currencies. We have raw materials which are going to be used primarily to advance your technology tree, the specific technology tree, as well as all of your provinces. You're using this a lot to forward your provincial capital buildings in your towers. So it's a very, very important um, currency in the very beginning of the game. You've got armaments, which are going to be used also for a research tree, but mainly you're going to be used to put anything into the Hellforge as far as increasing your unit caps and applying runes. Then lastly, Conclave, which is, again, a uh, branch in the research tree, but it is used towards um, the Tower of Zar mechanic, which is going to help give you a lot of uh, passives and whatnot in your campaign. You then also have labor, which is going to help you out with your workload. If I click this button, you want to make sure that your labor is at or above the workload amount so that you get 100% efficiency to maintain your raw materials coming into your provinces. Um, outside of that, we have military convoys, which act very similar to the Cathayan convoys. You'll send an expedition of a single lord who will then have, say, like this character has a bunch of infernal guard. And this lord will go to this location. We'll click this, hire a master. And they'll either get... they'll deposit, they'll, they'll sell the armaments and get labor, or they'll do it for gold and labor, or armaments and labor, whatever it is, all these are different throughout the map. Now we're looking at this from the Realm of Chaos perspective. We do, of course, do the Immortal Empires video in one big video with all three lords. So if you're waiting for that, that'll be further down the line. But again, just to kind of show you this off really quickly. Then we also have the Tower of Czar. Now the Tower of Czar has its individual levels, in which case will give you passive bonuses towards your campaign, and it will cost you Conclave to take these seats over. The big thing to note with the Tower of Czar is individual seats that you have taken will give your faction bonuses. But if the entire district is taken by you and AI um, factions, then the entire Chaos War faction will get the benefits of the district, but you only get the benefits of the seats you hold. To kind of put that into perspective, once that number reaches four out of four, no matter which seats on here you hold, everyone gets these bonuses. Then the seats that you individually hold, you get those bonuses. So if they take the all three of these, I get none of them. I just get this plus these three. But as you advance up this uh, thing, you have this conclave at the top, which allows you to confederate either Zar Nagran itself, Zatan the Black, or Drazoeth. And if you're playing one of the other characters, that the other one that you're not playing will swap into this slot over here. But that is your Tower of Zar that you use conclave to spend into. You then also have your Hellforge. Now your Hellforge is going to be how you increase your unit caps by expending your armament. And the total number of unit caps in a given category, so missile and infantry, we have three, plus one equals four, then goes towards unlocking runes in your manufactory. That manufactory gives you more and more runes as you go up this um, 
looks like it's every three right here, but the other one over here is five, then seven, then I think it's, yeah, so pretty much it's five, two, three, three, and then three. So you see how those kind of progress themselves. But you need to make sure that you're spending your armament so that you get access to the troops you want, depending upon maybe the lore that has an emphasis. Drazoeth, for example, has a better emphasis on the Chaos Dwarf infantry. Or um, Zatan the Black, who has better emphasis on Hobgoblins, which is not even in here. Or, well, kind of have better emphasis on himself. Or Astrogoth, who has a big emphasis on Bull Centaurs. This then comes into our menu factory, where you select a specific uh, category of units and you apply runes now these runes retroactively apply to your units you don't have to make brand new ones to take advantage of the runes so any existing unit then gets the rune applied to them but it's important to note that the there is an upkeep for applying these runes so rune of frenzy i've applied it to all three of my units of chaos dwarfs so it costs me 24 armaments per turn to have the rune of frenzy active if i were to add the rune of sundering that would make the total upkeep per soldier at 20 so there'd be 20 per unit times three so that upkeep would then go to 60. so it is a little bit more of a complex system it does require a little basic math but thank god it shows it all right here for you but it will also give you stuff like sundering attacks immune to contact effects causes fear physical resistance glittering scale spell resistance charge reflection plenty of things that you can do with that manufactory but those are your big mechanics with the Chaos Dwarfs. The other thing I do want to quickly touch on is that your provinces are divided into one of three settlement options, I guess you could say. Because you can even do this in, your, in what would be the provincial capital. You have the tower, which can only exist in a provincial capital. You have a factory. And then you have an outpost. If you jump into the building browser, you'll see that the tower is your big bad scary provincial capital with all sorts of big buildings and it cost uh, raw materials for infrastructure buildings and armaments for advanced military as well as raw materials for your settlement buildings like i said earlier when you jump into a factory it'll cost raw materials for the settlement buildings and for infrastructure and again advanced military will be your um armaments but your factories will produce will take raw materials and make armaments or gold, or you can just increase your raw material output. Versus an outpost, which will not cost you any raw material whatsoever to build buildings. It's all gold here, right? But you can see that this will produce raw materials and increase your workload, or this will increase, uh, this will just give you str straight up income, or this one will help out with campaign light aside and control. So you basically wanna make these throughout your empire as the campaign sees fit. Personally, and I know this is not a guide, but I like to do like a two to one ratio of two outposts to one factory in the early portions of the game. So that those are all the quick campaign mechanics here for the Chaos Dwarfs. You do also have the labor economy, which is, like I said, you're trying to make, you're balancing out these workloads to make sure that you have 100% efficacy or efficiency uh, you do that just like that you pay the money and it's done and the last thing here is your great drill of hashit which forwards your campaign this great drill does a lot of things and a lot of crazy mechanics and it's what is the driving force behind the entire campaign in the realm of chaos but now that we've covered that let's move on so with Drazoeth, we're going to go through now his character skills as well as his faction skills. So we're going to press, is it F1? Well, there's a button that does this, but can't remember what it is. So we have our character here with his faction effect, Sentinel of Ashes, giving him armament costs minus 10% for all unit capacity upgrades in the Hellforge across the board. Doesn't matter what it is, which is an awesome benefit. You get this as an actual bonus in the Tower of Zar, so you can stack this to get a 20% armament cost reduction. It's very nice. Armament output is also increased by 10% for him, allowing him to take advantage of that pretty well. Uh, just to kind of look at his climates, we get frozen, magical forest, wasteland, mountain, ocean, chaotic, wasteland, temperate, temperate island, savanna, desert, and then the jungle. And for the character, let's jump into his character details. He starts with Burning Wrath and Dark Subjugation. He is a sorcerer prophet of Hashut and thus has the entire Hashut line. But he also has a special ability here called Dark Renown. So this is going to increase the melee attack of um, friendlies around him in 35 meters as long as they have Contempt. Contempt is the special combat mechanic for the Chaos Dwarfs. And essentially, anyone with Contempt 
does not suffer any kind of leadership penalties for anyone that is breaking or fleeing if they don't have contempt. So the entire Hobgoblin roster, for example, does not have contempt, so they don't care if they're fleeing. Conversely, the Hobgoblins get a bonus to their leadership if they are within range of someone with contempt. So you have that kind of balancing act there. And also, Chaos Dwarfs get a flat bonus to their fire resistance rather than having spell resistance that their uncorrupted brothers get. His personal trait here is the Tyrant of the Black Tower, campaign movement range, upkeep reduction for Kadai units, and then passive ability is Dark Renown, which we took a look at. But of course, he gets an upkeep reduction for those Kadai units. Remember when I said he was Infernal, or, uh, Infernal Guard focused? I lied. I lied. It's, there, there's other things he focuses in. And his stat line, of course, is armor pretty, pretty decent at 125 because he is a dwarf, but melee attack 45, 65 melee defense, and then 430 weapon strength with a good juicy 130 AP and 20 bonus versus infantry. Moving into his skills here uh blue line is just very standard fare run of the course run of the mill stuff here just to kind of quickly hover over that in case you are wondering what it's like for the chaos dwarfs i'm just going to quickly show these off so that you see all of them and then you can pause and go back to any of these that you wish to kind of take a look at and then the red line too um Typical fare here, but just to give you an idea of what the spread is like, we have all the hobgoblins in in one and the laborers. Then we get all of the Chaos Dwarf units, including the Regiment of Renown and the Infernal Iron Swarm. We get all of the range units, both hobgoblin and Chaos Dwarf. I'm sorry, these two are uh, infantry related. Then we get all of the war machines. We're going to get all of the bull centaurs right here. And then all the monstrous creatures, including both the Kadai and lastly, the Skullcracker. Oh, okay, so Skullcracker is, is separate here. I thought the Skullcracker was part of the War Machines one, so I apologize for that. And then you get your rank 7 bonuses with Rally and Standard Die. For his um, yellow line here, you can see that right here, the Deadly Onslaught, which is pretty nice to have on him. Then he gets the uh, his line for the spells for the for actually the Lore of Hashet. Going through each one of those with Burning Wrath, Dark Subjugation, Ash Storm, and then Curse of Hashit in the beginning before jumping into Hellhammer and Flames of Asgore with Arcane Conduit at the end for Drazo with the Ashen. Now for his line, he gets Towering Heights, which helps out with research, construction, both time and cost reductions here. He gets We Are Legion. This is the benefit here I was talking about with the Infernal Guard and the Infernal Iron Sworn. A massive upkeep reduction here, as well as a bonus versus infantry. And, oh, that's a really nice bonus versus infantry. And then armament cost reduction for increasing capacity. So you can stack that with the 10% he already gets. That's a 35% right there, which is really nice. Then Greed of, Greed of Asgore is going to give income from cities and raw material output. Master of Hell is going to help out with his Kadai generation here by reducing that armament cost for capacity, weapon strength bonus, and physical resistance bonus for these dudes. You can stack that up over here with Hellish Blow. Oop, there we go. To give them, so that's 22%. Or I'm sorry, it's 12% weapon strength and 6 melee attack. You put, you put those two together and you're looking at 27% of weapon strength coming into them. Ashen's going to help out with hit points when recovering and giving him a 600 point barrier, which is really nice. But then lastly, he gets long years of exile, making it so that the winds of magic cost from the flames of Asgore is reduced by 6 on the base level. Um... I believe the actual spell here, okay, yeah, so it brings it down to 12, which is actually quite nice. Uh, makes it a little bit more palatable versus, say, Hellhammer here, which has 16. So you can see that brings it even below that. Then he gets Unyielding Command, which is a leadership and character order leadership effect bonus. Hashet Scale for spell resistance, missile resistance here, the typical mentor. And then Cinder Breath is his mount that he gets at 11. Lastly, we have his quest items, which has a whole set. Not all of the lords get a set as a quest item or uh, for all their items. The Master of the Black Fortress gives him melee attack for embedded Infernal Castellian, and then leadership reduction for all enemies in the region. For the Graven Scepter, we're going to get control, melee attack, and the ability to increase his damage as well as melee attack and give him magical attacks. The Demon Spite Crucible, which is another little nice ability for its passive ability for that gives him spell mastery for each kill made by the unit. This maximizes out at 20%. Targeting range plus 10% for lore of hatchet spells as well as leadership and spell resistance for him. Uh, leadership for the whole army of five.
Then the Hell Shard Amulet is going to help out with melee damage reflection plus 20, damage resistance plus 10%, as long as he is in melee, keep that in mind. Then the Winds of Magic Power Reserve and Ward save for the entire army. It's a very, very nice little amulet here that he does get. And he starts, too, with a uh, Infernal Castellan. So if you've not seen the, the skill line for the Infernal Castellan, allow me to show you. Infernal Death Mask here is for uh, Fear and Immunopsychology. And Inspiring Inferno gives Immunopsych for pretty much all of the Infernal Guard plus um, Chaos Dwarf units. And the typical kind of stuff here, immortality and what have you. Now, he has a line that is very similar to the Vampire Coast um boom boom dude i don't know what his name is off the top of my head he gives extra powder which you can see here armor piercing and base uh base explosiveness with 35 meters for um all allies in range that are missile attack capable and he'll then get restock which allows you to replenish ammunition um with four uses of that now he does have two different types of gunfire he can either go infernal slugs to basically turn him into a shotgun uh, with explosive bullets that give him dragon breath with 50 percent less range um, both give him dig in but then this gives him some bonus to his armor and melee defense he gets a flash bomb and then he gets in your face which gives him vanguard deployment and then explosive missile damage plus 100 or he goes hellforged bolts and gets a sniper rifle more or less getting in range increased to 207 and gets magic attacks he still gets that dig in capability skirmish tactics which helps out with speed he now has stock but he loses armor cinder blast shell which is a massive damage shot here at 530 um, and then lastly molten cores which enables sundering attacks so he can be a real cool sniper or a shotgun blast dude that gets up close and personal it is your choice with the castellian now, having spoken about all of the skills and whatnot, let's go into the technology tree. Now, the technology tree will be the same for all three of our lords, but it's worth noting the very first thing you should do in any one of their cast dwarf playthroughs is immediately press this button. It's going to make it so that your convoys come out at rank three, giving them two skill points to invest into hopefully dodging ambushes or whatever it is. And you can only do convoys at turn five. On turn five, if you press this right on turn one, it'll complete. But your three technology trees are broken up into military, which is going to give you bonuses to hobgoblins, bull centaurs, and large beasts on the left, and then chaos dwarfs and war machines on the right, with bonuses towards like general stuff like upkeep or um, max active hellforge, forgecraft options, whatever it is, on the top here. And that's going to cost you armament. Sorcery is going to give you mainly civic bonuses with some stuff towards. Uh, magic in certain portions of this but it's also going to cost you conclave and industry is going to give you bonuses towards your um convoys right here and then mainly towards any kind of specific bonuses for um having raw materials or or uh, specific resources right like iron and timber provide 15 percent armaments output for province what have you and this is going to cost you raw materials but the question is we're playing as so with what do we do here so i would type in infernal guard and I would maybe go for hollow rounds or weapons of war to get ben benefits into some of the things that I want. Oh, that's probably not what I want. There we go, Infernal Castellian. That helps out with my Infernal Castellian uh, uh, production here. Or anything that kind of goes heavily onto... Kadai. Oop, this thing has got a really weird, funky thing here. So that's going to give me bonuses on my Kadai here, right? So that physical resistance bonus I get in my actual skill tree, well, now I'm going to get an additional 10%. And I'm going to get flammable on attacks for Kadai units that are ranked 7 and above. And now their armament cost is reduced by a further 10%. If you're stacking all this up together, you're going to get a massive reduction in your armament cost to increase the capacity for your Kadai across this technology, across your Tower of Czar, across his skill in specific. Boiling Blood Sacrifices here helps out with melee defense and weapon strength. So if you remember what we talked about before, I think it was 22 or 27% from his skills. Well, this can bring it up to that 32 or 37%. So Kadai can get very disgusting, very disgusting with Drazoeth. But he's still, like I said too, he can get plenty of bonuses here with um, his Infernal Guard. I guess this is still Infernal Guard. Hollow Rounds applies to Infernal Guard, but so does like Call to War. I don't know why that didn't highlight that. But um, still, re regardless, you can see that there are lots of ways to increase your benefits. There you go, very training. Armament cost reduction for them for melee and missile infantry units and recruitment rank for Chaos Dwarf infantry. So really look at these. I think of all the lords, 
Drazoeth is the one that can really go hard in the paint on making a really good Chaos Dwarf line and really good Kadai. The other ones, Ashergoth specializes more towards the Bull Centaurs. And Zatan specializes more on himself with a smaller emphasis on like laborers and, and hobgoblins. So really look at this here to make sure you're getting the most out of um, uh, Drazoeth and making sure that you really kind of capitalize on his technology tree. Okay, so we've covered pretty much everything now. So what does this campaign actually play like? And it's worth noting that I, I've got a cool mod here so it reduces the fog of war a little bit and we can see a bit better what's going on. We have got the other two bros right here and here, respectively. But the nice thing about Drazo is, you know, he's, he's a man in exile. He's far off to the eastern portions of the map. And what I like about that is with Drazoeth, you have a lot more free reign to expand how you see fit. You have this whole entire province here with the Shattered Bone Bay, right? Is that the name of the province? No, the Noblar country. Whoopsies. I'm stupid. Uh, you have the whole province over here with Ivory Road, the Haunted Forest. Um, and then you can go north over here into Cathay. I think what makes Drazoa's campaign so fun and interesting is that he has more room to expand. And what I find over here with Ashragoth, he butts up eventually with Zatan the Black. And he's already butted up to with the Plains of Tsar. So his eastern expansion is, is limited immediately. Um, his northern expansion is going to be a lot of uh, Chaos Ogres. What? Those aren't the things. It's going to be a lot of Ogre Kingdoms. Um, but And you do get that here too, of course, with Drazoeth. But Drazoeth, to me, I think he's the underdog of the three. People seem to really like Astrogoth. And I think Zatan is the one that no one thought they would like, but they're really loving. But Drazoeth, I think... Pound for pound is the strongest lord. He gets he doesn't get a Lamasu, but he still gets Cinder Breath. He gets he's very, very tanky. Very tanky for a, a sorcerer prophet, you know, for a caster character. And on top of it, he gets the best bonus bonuses to some of the coolest portions of the roster. He's benefiting the Chaos Dwarf um actual line, the actual Chaos Dwarf line, and he's benefiting the Kadai. The other ones don't get those benefits. I think that a lot of people are gonna fall on Drazoeth after they realize how cool and fun this campaign is in the Realm of Chaos uh, campaign. In the Immortal Empires, he is up against even more competition in the South, and we'll quickly show that off here. But I think it's worth noting that this is the underdog in the campaign as far as the other three go, and I think that he's just got so much fun expansion to his wet, to his East and North, with an, a good amount of insulation to his West. Like, right here, he has Overlords of Zarduk, he has the... Uh, um, Servants of the Conclave, which is Zar Zarnagrand. So no one's going to bother him to his west. He can go east. He can go north. He's got these little quick, little tiny mountains of Morn, Carrick, Azorn, uh, Dwarfs, which are not going to be a problem for you. Um, but you have a lot of fun and a lot of freedom to do what you want, whereas the other two feel very cramped by comparison. So hopefully that gives you a really good idea of how... Um, Drazoeth plays in the Realm of Chaos map. Let's quickly pivot to the Immortal Empires just to show off his starting location and what it's like for him. Loading into the Immortal Empires map, we have a starting location that is the same, roughly, right? He starts at the Black Fortress, just like he did in the Realm of Chaos, but it's, of course, a truncated Darklands. And you can see where he starts is, is kind of wild. He does have Imric right here. Um, he's going to have some other bros to our west. Well, we've got the technology. Let's do it. There we go. So we can see that he does have um, friends up north. And it's the game's not going to like me doing that. <laughs> I'm going to zoom back in. There we go. <laughs> um, so he does have some friends up north here that he can take advantage of and make some alliances with. But he is surrounded by the most part by a lot of legendary lords. South. Southeast. And then directly east. Which not too bad. I mean, it's not like he's completely cramped up here. He has plenty of means of expanding west. I mean, he also does have Crookback right here, right, too. Trush Craven Tail. But he pretty much gets the hollow wastes to himself in an easy grab, both Darkhold and the Sentinels. So, taking a look at this on the map, it's a pretty fun start. Uh, Zatan the Black has a pretty crazy one, too, but I think Drazoeth gets the same kind of treatment that he has from the Realm of Chaos in a very easy first pro province grab. And then he's butted up with some aggression between um, some Greenskins to the north with Crookback Mountain being Skaven, and then some Dwarfs to the south and High Elves to the south. And then you can kind of pick and choose how you deal with the Ogre Kingdoms to your south and east before eventually having to deal with Kugoth and... Um, uh, what's his nuts over here? 
uh, you, Helmand Gorst. I always forget his name for some reason. But definitely a very fun campaign. Again, I, he has the he has a little bit more free reign, more uh, less less kind of stamped between a bunch of really bad legendary lords that are going to come for him like it's going to be for Zatan or for um, Astrogoth. I think that the kind of freedom that Ast that uh, Drazoeth has in the Realm of Chaos he has duplicated here in the Immortal Empires. But hopefully this gives you an idea of how Drazoeth plays in both the Realm of Chaos and a little bit of how it goes here for the Immortal Empires. Go ahead and let me know in the comment section below if you're excited about this lord, if you didn't know this lord, how these fun goodies and now you're really excited about him, however you feel. I will be doing my best to worst breakdown of all three of the campaigns that'll come out whoa that'll come out um, a day or two before the 13th so probably the 11th or the 12th to give you a breakdown of them from the immortal empire's uh, perspective to help you determine if that's wh which character to play first in that regard but i wanted to cover the realm of chaos first as that's kind of like the big driving force is their narrative in that campaign so i wanted to give you that breakdown but as always guys thank you so much for watching here today have a good one and take care